Welcome to Pretty Lies and Alibis. Let's seek the truth and travel the long road to justice together. What you know, alibiers? Hope you guys have had a great Friday. I've been so busy. You know how it is right before you go out of town for a bunch of days and it's just chaos. And it's like a million things to do. Grammy had a doctor's appointment today, which went well. And just out buying things, trying to get like rules set up for my kids and oh boy, but super excited to be headed down to the low country on Sunday to cover this case that we're going to just run through. And I'm going to give you the cliff notes version because to be honest, guys, if we went through everything, we would be here until like Jesus returned. It's so convoluted. There's so many angles of this story. And so I'm going to kind of give you the basics to get you ready for trial. This is going to be two parts. I'm going to do part one tonight. And then I'm going to have part one pre-recorded for Monday just because that's the first day of me actually being down there. Jury selection starts. I don't really think there's going to be a whole lot uh, as far as jury selection for a whole episode on Monday. And I'm kind of just getting used to how to do things for the first time because I've done live hits here at home on my computer, but not out in the field. I have a lot to learn. And really looking forward to some of the people that are going to come down and help me with this. And uh, yeah, so this is uh, going to be pre-recorded. And I'm still going to update you on Monday, by the way. If you don't subscribe to YouTube, go ahead and subscribe. Hit that little bell for notifications. Be sure to like the videos as well. It pushes it out to people who might be interested. It helps the channel. It helps me grow. And I really appreciate it. But if you hit that little bell, if I do a YouTube short just for a little quick update, or if I go to a location that is relevant to the case, I might do a YouTube short. So be sure to get notifications and you will know when I post something new. Music fact of the day, I got to pull it back up because I had to restart because guess whose mic was muted again? Yeah, girl. Okay, so there was a poll of 12,000 music lovers of which songs do you hear and identify the quickest? So top three, we're going to do it right now. Number three, Eye of the Tiger by Survivor. It took people 2.6 seconds to recognize that song. Number two, Mambo Number 5 by Lou Vega. 2.4 seconds. And number one, Wannabe by the Sc Spice Girls coming in at 2.2 seconds. That's pretty surprising. Although, yeah, it's really true. But there are so many songs that you can identify in a split second. So let's dive right in. And this family goes way back to the low country for nearly a century. So the Murdoch family has held South Carolina's 14th circuit solicitor position for almost a hundred years. And so as the grip on these, these uh, different counties, these areas has been pretty solid for a very, very long time. And I think too, the hesitation for people who know them or knew them to talk on camera for fear. And I've talked to several people who I've tried to get some interviews arranged while I'm down there. And they're like, I'm just not going on camera. I think given everything that has transpired since the boat crash that killed Mallory Beach, the boat was driven by Paul Murdoch, who was murdered allegedly by his dad. And, and that trial obviously is coming up the double murder trial. Um, people still, that grip is still kind of there and it's very very interesting so it gives you an idea of how powerful this family has been for generations so anyways i wanted to kind of figure out where i want you know to start and so i decided to start with stephen smith now things went on before obviously that we could talk about but this beautiful boy, Stephen Smith, 19 years old, nursing student, July 8th, 2015. Uh, his body was found in the roadway after allegedly running out of gas and walking to a gas station. Although none of this fits, his family doesn't buy it. He was going the wrong way, apparently, to get to a gas station. He had a phone. He could have called. He called his sister earlier in the day when he had car trouble. But when uh, the 911 call came in for a man in the roadway, 
the gentleman thought, you know, somebody needed to get there and help him. He said he's going to get hit. So when the South Carolina Highway Patrol arrives on scene, everybody kind of thinks it's blunt force trauma. And a gunshot was mentioned as a possibility. Uh, but ultimately, his death was ruled a hit and run, although there was no evidence at the scene indicating that that was the case. Witnesses say it looked like his body had just been placed there. Another thing, too, when somebody gets hit by a car, a lot of times they are knocked out of their shoes. Now, his shoes were on very loosely, and a hit and run would have probably knocked him out of those shoes, but his shoes were still on his feet. Trooper Proctor is one of a few who have fought tooth and nail for the truth about this young man's death to come out. And he, his opinion was it looked like Stephen had been just placed in the roadway. Now, if you have HBO Max or if you've watched the HBO Max three-part series on this, this case, on the Murdoz, uh, they do show some of the crime scene photos um, they're blurred out, but they're very graphic and it, it really does look staged. It, it, it really does. There was no vehicle debris. There were no skid marks, no injuries consistent with somebody being struck by a vehicle, but the medical examiner, Dr. Aaron Presnell, who conducted the autopsy at MUSC concluded this was a hit and run. So her report said the cause of death was blunt head trauma from a motor vehicle crash, pedestrian versus vehicle, with the manner of death being undetermined. Now, in the days after, in the weeks after his, his death, it was put out there. He was likely struck by the mirror of a passing vehicle. Although Trooper Proctor strongly disagreed, he wrote in a report on July 22, 2015, that he actually visited with Dr. Presnell and noted that she spoke in a negative tone and said it was a hit and run because he was found in the roadway. In, his, in Trooper Proctor's report, he said she asked why we did not think it was a vehicle strike, and I explained to her we had no evidence of him being hit by a vehicle. When Trooper Proctor asked if it were possible that Stephen could have been struck with an object such as a bat from a moving vehicle, Dr. Presnell allegedly told him the report was preliminary and it was his job, not hers, to find out what struck Stephen. Proctor also spoke to the coroner in August of 2015 who also disagreed with the pathologist's findings. Now, there are have been rumors about Stephen possibly being involved with Buster Murdoch. It's never been proven, It's, um, but it has been put in mainstream media, and so I'm comfortable putting that here. Also, it's important to note that the Murdoch's were named over 40 times in the investigation into his death, but nothing ever came from it, and they were never interviewed in that initial investigation. So, what happened, it went cold for a while. And then these murders happened with Paul and Maggie. And SLED reopened the investigation into his death. And I am so glad. Trooper Proctor said this case has stuck with him. Stephen's mother, Sandy, made a statement after Alec was indicted on the murder charges. She said, we've waited for a long time in Steve for Aunt we have waited for answers for a long time in Stephen's death, but I'm not the only grieving loved one who needs help. I know that other loving family members have also searched for answers in the deaths of their family members. I'm happy SLED and the Attorney General's office have provided some closure and answers in the death of Maggie and Paul. While many questions about my son's death remain, this action gives me hope that we will get justice for my Stephen. We think of him and miss him every day, and we grieve with the members of the Murdoch and Brandsetter families, that's Maggie's maiden name, who have been left behind. It was a very class act statement in spite of the pain and the possible connection to the Murdoch family in the what I say is the murder of her son. So hopefully that will um, that will resolve with answers and with anybody responsible who's still alive 
uh, being held responsible and answering for taking that man's life so young. Um, the HBO Max series has interviews with his twin sister and his mother. And it's so sad because uh, I think three months to the day of Stephen's um, death, his father died. He grieved himself to death. His mother seems very strong. I know Mandy Matney has been very vocal in getting justice for Stephen. She, they, I know they had some fundraisers. He finally got a headstone. I would love to go pay my respects when I'm down there. Um, just to go visit and let's just hope for justice soon. Now, here we go. Number two, Gloria Satterfield, longtime housekeeper for the Murdoch family. She ran errands and, you know, they hired her to serve at their parties for a measly $10 an hour while these people are taking private jets to Gamecock basketball games. But, you know, that's another episode. She was a nanny to Paul and Buster, who they affectionately called Go-Go growing up. But guess what? She tripped and fell over one of the family dogs, allegedly at the Moselle property, where the double murders took place, by the way. She wasn't on the job. She was there to pick up a paycheck for either herself or someone else. But the commotion woke Maggie up, and then she wakes Paul up. A 911 call was placed at 9 to 24 a.m. and both Maggie and Paul expressed frustration at some point during this this call with dispatch about the number of questions being asked prompting the dispatch person to tell Maggie me asking questions does not slow them down ma'am when Paul gets on the phone with dispatch after a bit she says can you ask the patient what kind of pain she's having Paul says ma'am she can't talk she's cracked her head and there's blood on the concrete and she's bleeding out of her left ear and out of her head. She's cracked her skull. I was holding her up, and she told me to turn her loose, and she was trying to use her arm, but then she fell back over. Eventually, Paul gets frustrated by the questions as well, and he says, Ma'am, can you please stop asking all these questions? The dispatch says, I already have them on the way, and me asking questions does not slow them down in any way. These are relevant questions I have to ask for the ambulance. Now, Alec was at work at the time, which was 20 minutes away. He rushed home and actually arrived before first responders, who arrived at 9 at 41 a.m. Before Alec arrived home, Paul tried to pick her up, and she told him to turn her loose, and she fell over, like Paul said. When Alec arrived, he and Paul sat her up on the stairs. She had been at the brick landing, kind of at the base of the stairs. Before EMTs arrived, Gloria was said to be talking in a way that didn't make sense. Alec told EMTs that Gloria told him one of the dogs tripped her up. He is the only person, by the way, who heard this. He followed the ambul ambulance and Gloria was actually placed in a helicopter to be transported for treatment. They gave Alec her purse and he tried calling her brother and didn't get him. She allegedly told hospital staff that she doesn't know why she fell. Her injuries, y'all, were terrible. She had a right-sided head laceration, right-sided subdural hematoma, traumatic brain injury, multiple rib fractures on the left side, a partially collapsed lung, and pulmonary contusions. She had surgery on her broken ribs, and they had to reconstruct her chest wall. They also removed blood from her chest cavity. Some of the head injuries, just they were not operable. The days in the hospital and her injuries just resulted in a rapid decline in her health, and she died three weeks later. So on February 28th, 2019, that's when she died, and the coroner was never called, there was no autopsy done, and her death was ruled natural. Now, I'm just going to say, if you're falling down a few steps, I don't see how in the world you get all those injuries. So it was announced last year that they were planning to exhume her body. We have not heard if this has happened or not. If you follow the Lori Vallow Chad Daybell case, you know when they exhumed Tammy Daybell, it was done very quietly. They had her exhumed, the autopsy conducted, and back in the ground within a matter of seven or eight hours. But we've never heard if they've actually exhumed her body yet. But what did Alec do? This is opportunity for the guy. He brought on Corey Fleming, his BFF, his college roommate, and also 
godfather to Buster, his other son. They, um, he was brought on to represent Gloria's son, sons in a wrongful death suit that Alex told the boys, essentially, you need to sue me. We'll get you some money. One of Gloria's sons uh, has autism. And, um, you know, to think that he would do this to anybody is just disgusting. But also, you know, somebody who she she apparently was an amazing mother to these boys. And they trust, she trusted the Murdoch family, apparently, and these boys did too. Long story short, there was a payout on this claim, and her sons never knew. They did not know until well after the fact when all this hit the fan. We know that as a busy parent, you don't have time to completely overhaul your life in the new year. One change that's easy to make that will make your life easier in 2023 is Little Spoon. Most of the baby and kid foods at the grocery store is heavily processed and often on the shelf longer than your little one has been in this world. Not cool, and not the quality nutrition our kids deserve. Little Spoon makes everything fresh, organic, and uses absolutely nothing artificial. It's just like homemade, all delivered to your door and ready in seconds. From baby food to big kid, Little Spoon has you covered for years. Little Spoon even hides vegetables and chicken nuggets, mac and cheese, and more. Their smoothies come in pouches that make on-the-go snack easy, healthy, and tasty. And yes, I tried one. They're great. Did I mention it comes right to your door? It's flexible, easy, and everything stores in the refrigerator or freezer. You can pick your menu for a variety of foods to introduce to your child. The price is right. The quality is unmatched. So make this year's chaos a little more manageable with time-saving, delicious, and healthy meals and snacks your kids will love. Go to littlespoon.com and enter my code WHATTHEWORLD at checkout to get 50% off your first Little Spoon order. That's littlespoon.com and enter WHATTHEWORLD for 50% off at checkout. Our next partner is Athletic Greens. I take AG1 by Athletic Greens literally every day. I gave AG1 a try because I'm always busy and my diet isn't the best, but I still want to get all the vitamins my body needs without taking a ton of pills. I take AG1 in the morning before my first cup of coffee and it makes me feel ready to take on my day. Why take a bunch of different things when you can just mix one scoop of powder in water once a day? It's the healthiest thing you can do in under a minute. With one scoop, I'm getting 75 vitamins and minerals that help my mood, energy levels, and healthier hair, skin, and nails. It's delivered to me every month and it's been the easiest way to arm my body with everything it needs to tackle my day. If you're looking for an easier way to take supplements, Athletic Greens is giving you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Go to athleticgreens.com slash what the world. That's athleticgreens.com slash what the world. Check it out. They still don't know the full circumstances surrounding their mother's fall. And it's important to note the judge in Alex Bond hearing asked the state if there were any investigations he he should consider before setting Bond and guess who was named. Stephen Smith and Gloria Satterfield's cases were named. So that brings us to the boat crash that I think set this all in motion. I think this was the beginning of the end for the Murdaugh dynasty. And, you know, people love to see the good old boy system, the rich and the powerful who are evil come crumbling down, but not when there's innocent people who are dead in the process. Um, But before we get to the boat crash that claimed the life of Mallory Beach, back in 2017, Paul was 17 at the time, and he was fined for underage possession of alcohol by the Department of Natural Resources along with two of his friends. That same day, he paid a $510 fine for littering and a bench warrant that had been issued for him for failure to comply was removed. His father represented him in that underage drinking case as well as another attorney from Beaufort. The jury trial for that was rescheduled five times, and in May of 2018, Paul was sentenced to an alcohol diversion program. Those charges were dismissed when he completed the program. So that takes us to February 24th, 2019. Paul 
and some friends meet at his house to go to an oyster roast. Now, in the South, low country especially, um, the um, oyster roasts are very, very popular. The friends are Morgan, who is Paul's girlfriend, Miley, Anthony and Connor Cook, who are cousins, and then you have Mallory Beach, who is Anthony's girlfriend. Now, Paul was known to be a mean drunk, and his friends had this name for this alter ego that came out when he got drunk that they called Timmy. And in a police interview, Miley said that when Paul is drunk, his fingers spread wide and he's unable to put them back together. So how did they get so drunk that night? Well, Paul buys alcohol at Parker's Convenience Store with his brother Buster's ID. Parker's Convenience Store, if you've been listening to episodes in the last week, part of that lawsuit was settled and uh, Buster and his mom Maggie were taken off that lawsuit. And But Parker's, I believe, is still involved in their own lawsuit for selling the alcohol to the underage Paul Murdaugh, as you see in this picture. So between 7.30 and 8, Paul and his friends arrived to the oyster roast, and the homeowner says no alcohol was served. But when the kids arrived, Miley did have a white claw, but threw it out because her parents were attending that oyster roast as well. So they left around 11.30. And so the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources, uh, they used data from the boat's GPS to determine that they actually left that oyster roast around 12, 11 a.m. And they headed towards Henry Chambers Waterfront Park. Along the way, actually, the boat nearly co collided with Woods um, Spring Bridge, um, which is the bridge you'll see. Woods Swing Bridge, I'm sorry. It's on the top left. I have all the pictures and a link in the description, by the way, if you're not on YouTube watching. And they arrived at the waterfront park at 12:49 a.m. near the New Day Dock in Beaufort. So Paul and Connor decided they wanted to go to Luther's Rare and Well Done, which is a waterfront restaurant and bar. And at this point Paul's already drunk and his girlfriend Morgan didn't want them to go to Luther's. They had an argument about it. Paul was persistent. So they enter the place at 12:55 a.m. Paul orders a round of shots, and at 12.59 a.m., another shot. Or, I'm sorry, they enter at 12.55. He orders a round of shots at 12.59, and then shortly after, a second round of shots. 1.08 a.m., Paul and Connor leave the bar. Less than eight minutes, by the way, Paul took two shots of liquor on top of already being, as we say in the South, and his grandfather said it in the hospital, drunker than Cooter Brown. 1.13 a.m., Paul and Connor meet back up with everyone. You can see here on the bottom, you've got Paul. I've got the arrow pointing to him circled. I have um, Mallory Beach and her boyfriend, Anthony, who, by the way, y'all, he's on that HBO Max series about this case. And I'm going to tell you, this is, a, this is a really, really good kid. He seems like he has a heart of gold. He's forgiving. He forgave Paul for what happened. Um, he would not speak bad about Paul on that documentary. But most importantly, you could tell the love he had for this girl was genuine. And that last photo of Mallory, I watched the surveillance video. And you see the huge smile. They're just goofing off. There's drama with Paul. That was kind of expected when Paul was drinking anyway. They're just in their own little world right there. She's laughing at him. He's laughing at her. I just think they're, oh man, it's just such a tragedy. So at one, at one thirteen, they meet back up with everyone. One seventeen a.m., they leave the dock. So arguments start to break out on the boat. Paul had slapped his girlfriend a couple of times, spit in her face. And also there was some arguments about the way Paul was driving. And so... Anthony, which is Mallory's boyfriend, asked Paul to let them off at the nearest dock. And he was going to get an Uber home because he was a little scared of how Paul was driving, but Paul refused. So Anthony asked if he could drive the, ball, the, the boat. And he Paul told him that was his boat. You can't drive it. 
So Paul takes off his shirt, struts around. Connor takes control of the boat, but Paul stops Connor saying, this is my boat. I'm driving. At this point, some of the occupants on the boat are frightened and they're huddled on the floor because of the way Paul was driving. Morgan told Paul she was done with him and he called her a lot of not so nice names. Paul is seen on video from surveillance camera doing donuts in the water. It's just spinning round and round. It's pitch dark. It's foggy that night and it's kind of cold. So GPS shows a de decrease in speed of the boat than an increase. Paul was arguing with his girlfriend Morgan at the time and around 2.20 a.m. the boat slams into a piling at Archer's Creek Bridge. There are six people on the boat. Only five make it to the road safely. Mallory Beach, who was 19 at the time, did not resurface. And after a week-long search, her body was found in a marsh about five miles away on March the 3rd, 2019. Now, back to that night. At the scene with first responders and police all over the place, Paul calls his grandpa, Grandpa Randolph. And Miley said Paul went back and forth about whether or not to call his dad, but eventually he did. Anthony Cook is seen and heard on police dash cam and body cam video just upset, calling his parents and yelling at Paul, who's kind of pacing around. Uh, he's telling Paul it's not funny. Anthony tells the cop that he's with that Paul is Alec Murdaugh's son and says, good luck. Like, in other words, you know, because the cop had heard the name. So the boat. The South Carolina Department of Natural Resources described the condition of the boat. The front left side, which would be the driver's side, is split open from the nose all the way to the back. There is a six-foot gash where the boat actually came apart at the scene. On the 911 call, you can hear in the background Morgan screaming, there's so much blood, where's Mallory? Paul, nor anyone in that group, was given a field sobriety test on scene in spite of the fact that an officer on scene noted all five were grossly intoxicated. The Department of Natural Resources investigator assigned to the case put in his report that he instructed an agent to give a field sobriety test to Paul and Connor since it was possible they both could have been driving the boat. However, the agent who was to do the test said he was instructed to only give the test to Connor Cook. He said he did not try to test Paul. In his report, however, it says both Paul and Connor refused to be tested. Later on, the DNR said the tests were not administered because the kids had already been taken to the hospital by the time their agent arrived on scene to do so, and agents weren't immediately sure who was driving the boat. The Beaufort County Sheriff's Office said they didn't give the test because it was inappropriate to get involved since the Department of Natural Resources is the agency responsible for investigating boat crashes. So Anthony Cook told officers that Paul was driving the boat when it crashed, but the officer did not write that in his report. Instead, he wrote that Anthony did not know who was driving. Anthony specifically said he was on the floor of that boat holding on to Mallory and Paul was driving. So everyone was taken to the Beaufort Memorial Hospital. And by the way, this photo here, I just had to put it up because you just see the love between those two. And then you just, if you've seen that special on HBO, there is a lot of video. I've never seen hospital footage. There's uh, some footage of the boat and then a lot of body cam and police dash cam footage in the aftermath. So everybody was taken to Beaufort Memorial Hospital and Paul was out of control inside that ambulance and he had to be restrained. At one point it was said he was laughing and joking with people. So he was brought into the stretcher, I mean into the ER on a stretcher. They arrived at 3:39 a.m. and he said some inappropriate things to nursing staff and it wasn't long before dad and grandpa arrived. And they kind of stu stood guard outside of his door to keep him from being interviewed by law enforcement. Alec wasted no time in trying to control that investigation. And this goes in depth in that HBO Max series, by the way. They really, they have interviews with Anthony's parents, with Connor's parents, uh, a lot of people that knew the Murdoch. So um, they get, but Connor's parents 
are about an hour drive away from the hospital. But while they're driving, they get several calls from Alec where he's trying to convince them that Connor was driving the boat, which really just creating reasonable doubt. So Connor's parents said when they got to the hospital, Alec and his dad were trying to orchestrate and control everything. He told Connor's dad he had influence over the judge and juries, and he would take care of Connor. So on the series about the case, Connor's dad said Randolph Murdoch was heard saying, well, she's gone. Ain't no need to worry about her talking about Mallory. The hospital did do a blood alcohol test on Paul and he was more than three times the legal limit to drive a car in South Carolina. Now, just for perspective, that blood draw was at 4 a.m. That was three hours after he and Connor were seen taking shots at the bar at on the waterfront and about an hour and a half after the crash. So that could have come down. I mean, he was drunk as a skunk, drunker than Cooter Brown, all those things and unfortunately it cost a life a beautiful beautiful young girl so the hospital did um this they have the cctv footage it shows connor cook come in with with a really bad jaw injury he had to have surgery and everything um on his face his girlfriend's walking beside him and morgan also had a very bad hand injury a couple of fingers were split wide open it looked really nasty Alec was seen on surveillance, though, going into all the kids' hospital rooms. Wasn't checking on them to see how they were. He was encouraging them not to talk to law enforcement. Also, not to say who was driving the boat. Connor said that Alec told him to say he was driving the boat and to take the blame. Connor heard Paul tell his grandfather again, Connor was driving the boat. So, after all this, Alec referred Connor... Connor's family to an attorney, Corey Fleming, the same attorney who represented the Satterfields in the wrongful death suit, the same attorney who was his college roommate, best friend, godfather to Buster. And um, the Cooks didn't use Fleming once the relationship between the two of them were known, but uh, they didn't talk about having a very hard time finding a lawyer who would go up against a Murdoch. And so on April 18th, Paul was indicted on three counts of boating under the influence and pled not guilty in May of 2019. Now, he was never handcuffed. His booking photo was taken in the hallway of the courthouse, and he was let go on a $50,000 personal recognizance bond. Paul was also allowed to travel within the state of South Carolina. And uh, yeah, Sherlock just came in. So, um, uh, here's some photos of Paul in court uh, at that arraignment for those charges and just never even saw the inside of a jail cell, y'all. If that were you or me, we probably would not even be out uh, on any kind of bond when there's death involved of boating under the influence. So that's kind of where I'm going to leave off because... There's a lot of um, there's a lot of lawsuits that come into play, and we'll touch on that in the next episode. But the murders, I really want to do the next part solely on what we know so far about the murders, because I really, like I said in the beginning, I really do believe this boating accident started the, I guess the the reveal of or. I think he knew that this, along with the rumor, the rumor that's been talked about in mainstream media, that there was a chance Maggie might have been leaving him, although his attorneys say no. Regardless, that boat crash, with the possibility of maybe some trouble in paradise, his world was crumbling. That, you know, the motive, I still just don't get the motive, but. We'll get into that next episode. That will be coming out on Monday. I want to thank AG1 by Athletic Greens and Little Spoon for sponsoring this week. That's how I get to do what I do, which is what I love more than anything. Um, next week, got a great sponsor base. Some really awesome weekend bags and luggage and stuff like that. Um, I'm already hooked. So anyways... All right, guys, have a good one and just wanted to give you a little backstory. There's a million articles out there on Stephen Smith and Gloria Satterfield, Mallory Beach. 
if you want to learn more, also check out that back catalog. There's several episodes that go a lot more in depth about Stephen Smith, especially. So, all right, guys, until Monday, I'll see you guys in the low country, Colleton County, Walterboro, South Carolina, tiny little place I'm very familiar with. And uh, so, yeah, we got a new trial, y'all. Buckle up. It's going to be a good one. See you soon. Thank mm-hmm. you.